welcome to another weekly waffle and farm update from the last seven days. I start off by showing you our farm roads and why we like to keep them in such good condition. I also show you how we handle our haylage bales without damaging them. We harvested the last of our heavy land beet this week, which was a huge relief because it came out the ground in really good conditions. On Wednesday, we had our first Agri iFarm meeting of the season, and that was inside a local village hall. It was really well attended, which is fantastic because there's a lot of work goes into the trials that Agri and ourselves do. I've got clips from every presentation, but the one we had on nitrogen and its efficiency is really, really interesting. And there's some good points and information in there for those of you who are interested in reducing your costs with nitrogen uh, prices being so high this season. We also spread soil uh, onto the beet fields that's come out from under the beet cleaner when we are loading the lorries that you saw last week and we are cultivating the land that we've harvested the sugar beet this week uh, which is interesting as well and we've also uh, got a bit of an update on uh, the establishment of sugar beet uh, sorry establishment of wheat after sugar beet in the last uh, the last week before we get into this week's update i just wanted to answer a question that quite a few have come back to me from last week's video and that is regarding glyphosate and why have we controlled a uh, field such as this one behind me that's coming a spring crop with glyphosate instead of leaving it until next spring when we could possibly leave this as a, as a type of a cheap cover crop well the main reason is uh, a black grass and when black grass grows in the soil and it germinates and there'll be black grass in this field here behind me it emits uh, an allopathic type effect so the roots emit this toxin that stops other black grass from growing so you have to kill off the black grass that's there for more black grass to to germinate and we've had seven years now of really controlling black grass very hard and controlling it before Christmas as well as in the crop before the spring because we'll get fresh growth now um, in the spring has been a really important part of our black grass control strategy and obviously now the conditions are really good at the minute controlling it as well and in the spring it might not be it might be a lot wetter so the spray would do more damage and also this field here is coming sugar beet and if we have a crop in here uh, a sort of like a cover crop going into next spring it really would cause a difficulty with cultivations and these soils here are probably 40 percent clay and so we we need to treat this with care and we won't be able to get the crop established if we had a cover crop on here next uh, next spring so that's the main reason anyway on to this week's um edition and this week's update please click like click subscribe and come back to me as always with any questions We've got good farm roads everywhere, make so much difference at harvest time going up and down, getting back from the yard to the combine. You can go flat out down all these farm tracks instead of potholes and damage to machinery. But what does do them harm is bringing sugar beet out. We've got some sugar beet there to lift. We're going to do that this afternoon and tomorrow and it's going to be stored on a beet pad at the end of the field down there. But what does these lanes damage is when you've got sugar beet lorries coming down here when it's wet through and also frost. It really does a lot of damage to the tracks. But also when you've got soil on the lanes like this, tractors come out of a field, not sure whether it's hedge cutter or something. You can just see there's not a lot here, but all this just contributes to the farm tracks and the condition of them. So we always shovel up any lumps of uh, soil and mud that's dropped off tractor wheels and it just makes our farm tracks last so much better. I've got another haylage delivery to make locally. So I'm just gonna load the trailer up and then uh, I'll show you how this squeezer works and how we uh, load these bales without damaging them because it's crucial that they're not damaged. So we'll get this, uh, this trailer loaded and then we'll come back to this squeezer and explain how it works. So looking at one of these uh, squeezer attachments that we have on the front of the Manitou, this is how it works. There is absolutely no spikes or anything sticking through to go into the bale at, at the uh, back plate side. And the front here, this squeezer arm that's linked to a ram, that's smooth as well. Because if any of the bales are damaged, if the plastic wrapping here is punctured, 
it gets air in it and then it goes mouldy and that's the last thing you want with haylage because it doesn't do the horses any good they can actually uh, make them really poorly i think they can die from it if they eat some mouldy haylage so this back plate is smooth and it just relies on hydraulic pressure from that ram up there squeezing the bale and making this gap between there and the back plate smaller so it actually squeezes the bale and just grips it between those two and the and this is how it works um in uh, in close-up detail So you can see now looking at this bale's been pulled tight against this back plate you can see there how it's indented in but because it's all lovely round smooth corners it hasn't dented it or, or ripped the plastic then the front bar here you can see again has been pulled tight into the bale all smooth and round and it's the ram at the top that's done that on this uh, on this arm and so that's just purely it's done by hydraulic pressure squeezes that bale tight up to the back plate and that's uh, how you handle the Haley's bales. There's very numerous attachments. This is just one design. There are other designs where it squeezes it from this side of the bale um, and then also from this side of the bale as well. But that's uh, just a, a simple design. Quite an old attachment, but that's how it works. We're lifting some more sugar bait today. This is the last of the bait on our heavy, difficult soils. About 27 or 8 acres here. Tank's about full. That's why the trailer's here, ready to empty. Frankie, come here. Come on. See, so that's the elevator that carries the bait up into the tank. And that will get lowered in the unloading elevator to the trailer. Here we go. Bit sticky here today. Had two or three millimetres of rain early hours of this morning, but a little bit of soil stuck to the tyres but still very good conditions on this soil type for this time of year and just to remind some of you who probably don't realise that the machine's crabbing on purpose it's like that for to avoid ground compaction so the back of the machine doesn't follow the front so it spreads the weight across the soil surface so when you're looking down the field if you look there that is the line of the tires from the front of the machine and then we've got that there is from the back of the machine but it's lifting really well at the minute and then we'll get this field worked and planted wheat hopefully in the next three or four days while the conditions are quite good we we'll spread the tops this time out over the field rather than let them go through the machine so we'll see whether it makes any difference to the amount of work the sugar beet cleaner loader has to do loading the lorries anyway pleased with this going well at the minute unusual for being middle of november in these uh, conditions these trailers tip the beat quite high You'll see the angle that they tip at. The rams under these Bailey trailers here are further forward than the centre, so it tips it not vertical, but a lot more of an angle than grain trailers. 
you can see there and then it just lowers it slightly so it lifts the back door away from the heap to keep the beat at a nice height that's it that's another 18 tons so to make sure we can get more acres on the concrete we uh, push the beat up we've got an old blade that we used to use or we still use it for some of the smaller sheds um, but we use this to stack the beat up high obviously uh, this time of year when it's a lot cooler at nights you can do this you don't lose too much sugar and uh, we've got a blade there you can see we've got a rubber track on the front of the blade but we push it up high it makes so much difference to getting the tons on the concrete So you can see it's quite a length this is with the blade on the front as well. But this Manitou is a nine, nine meter each forklift, four ton capacity. And there you can see we've got the track, old quad track track on the front just to protect the beat a little bit. It's Wednesday morning and we've got our first iFarm meeting of the season. And this is an agri partnership we have, looking at all things technical and do lots of trials work. We invite lots of farmers to look and see how we can improve things. And we all work together and collaborate together and share information and knowledge. Nice to see we have English sugar. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the iFarm, the first one in two years that we've had Northern Breeders in. Um, we're fighting, hopefully. Um, just before we get going, a bit of uh, home uh, life, low temperatures, lots of rain uh, really caused some issues and, and Sectorio came in quite late. Um, where, I'm, where I sit in the country down to South Cambridge, Essex, um, Suffolk way, it's actually the third year that we've had Sectorio coming in late. Seeing some of these untreated crops, I think we were expecting uh, you know, a response much bigger than that. And as we come further east, these variety. Back it so it depends again. Go back to my first point what is it that you want to achieve? Health is a much more deeper philosophical question that is a very big picture that requires a lot of things. <laughs> Fixes nitrogen. But what I wanted to do was delve a little bit into that question, and I'm going to start with going back to high school. I'm sure that all of you here remember the nitrogen cycle, so I don't have to explain this. Um, but in essence, what we have is nitrogen all around us, we're breathing it currently. It is literally right all around us. And we have, if you think about beans, for example, fixing 110 kilos per hectare, if you're planting that in 2020, we fixed 20 odd thousand tonnes of nitrogen. So in 2020, we got to about 26,000 tonnes of nitrogen fixed just by the legume crops that were planted throughout the UK. Now, so I want to go a little bit further into the root structure. So some of the work that PGRI done, because again, a little bit like John's touching on blends, I'm going to touch on intercropping because it's a little bit of a hot topic at the moment. And so in terms of peas, the two most commonly found peas that I've spoken about are yellows and blues. Uh, yellow peas are arguably the easier of the two to grow, but that's basically on specification. So for those of you that have heard us speak before on this, we are looking at haricot beans and chickpeas as two options. So haricot beans are your dried beans for the canning sector. Um, we have a few varieties of different colours. Um, this one is the one the end users really want, which is a white bean for a baked bean sector. Right, lupins, uh, again, a little bit sort of left, <laughs> left field for us. We weren't expecting lupins to do what they did. Performed really well, yields were really great. This is a lovely high protein, homegrown feed story, right? And the beautiful thing is the variety we're promoting at the moment is a determinate variety. So this picture I love because it's taken on the 6th of September. Lupin's right, chickpeas nearly, soybean, yeah. Mm. Kind of thinking about filling pods, maybe. September. I mean, good luck combining that in January. Uh, so really, again, we talk about high nitrogen fixing capabilities. So going back to that story, it's all about the pH and the calcium levels. There was one site that bucked the trend. We don't know why, and we're investigating that. But what we do know is currently that is still our advice, is pH less than 7.5 and calcium less than 3,000 parts. But, again, what a fantastic story, 
and it's doing a job. Just some tips to see how we can make that nitrogen fertilizer go further and maybe improve the use efficiency of it as well because you know we're looking at very high prices for nitrogen fertilizer and I'm not being a smug git because I didn't really see this coming. We saw this is the 18th of May, this is a, a set of bullets I put on a presentation highlighting where the UK nitrogen price was going to start at. Uh, and, and it started at a level where we didn't really predict. We kind of thought maybe it would be close to the previous start price, and certainly thought maybe there could be a bit of a dip about this time of year. Well, how wrong were we? You know, these points were all true. Um, European fertiliser price benchmarks are higher year on year. Yes, they were. Uh, freight costs are an absolute fortune. Ammonia prices were high. The gas price was already nearly 120% um, up on previous gas price levels. And urea remained very, very bullish on the 18th of May. But we were all still thinking, could it come back in October, November? Well, how wrong were we all in the UK? But at the moment, we still see this tight market, so I can't give you any positive you know, comments in terms of the, the prices coming back at any point at the moment, okay? So, so just bear that in mind. Across urea, imported AN, Nitram, TSP, MOP, DAP, they are all feeling the spike and the rise uh, of fertiliser demand across the world and production costs and lack of actual physical stock that's there. Concern. So the, the fertiliser guy is going to try and give you some pointers to see if we can, we can help the situation. And fundamentally, all of this associates itself around use efficiency. So we need to get more out of the nitrogen fertilisers we apply. Uh, we need to improve the cycling of nitrogen in the soil. So Sky talked about adding legumes, but we need to think about how we can cycle nitrogen, and I'll talk upon that as well. And you, you, read, you read the publications, around 60% of that bagged fertiliser you apply is available to the crop, 40% is getting tied up in the nitrogen cycle. And I've, I've said this before on no end of occasions, but it's how do we improve that 40% in terms of making available nitrogen to the soil. Hence the, the, the microbial biomass, um, mineralisation, that's hugely important. Now you can do a test for that uh, with, with a soil nitrogen test or you can test it in a solvita test, or you can test it with an active carbon test, however you want to do it, but understanding how biologically active your soil is might give you an indication in terms of how much nitrogen you can cycle in the soil yourselves. It's all common sense stuff. But fundamentally, by the time the crop gets to about growth stage 31, the crop's taken up 100 kilos a hectare of nitrogen, or needs to have taken up 100 kilos a hectare of nitrogen. And we have, if we work on a 60% efficiency, that's around 165 kilograms of nitrogen from the soil and from fertilizers. It's not all about maximizing light intensity into the flag leaf, although my colleagues um, emphasizing things like that probably might say so. Maximizing green leaf retention right the way through the canopy is hugely important. So hence the reason why I said, just be careful with these thick crops that you might have coming out of the spring just maybe plan ahead. Maybe you, you're thinking, actually, I'm not going to load all my nitrogen on that really thick crop early because you're going to create a large canopy which will shade out light to those lower leaves, which are very productive in terms of yield. And then it takes me on to a trial we conducted with Andrew because uh, with Andrew, we, we, we take numerous soil nitrogen samples. I say we because unfortunately Fred's doing most of the analysis these days. <laughs> And we went with the NCALC, which came in at 140 kilograms a hectare of nitrogen. And then also, I wanted to look at a carbon source as well. So we added a product which is a form of sugars, molasses, uh, just to see if that helped increase nitrogen availability. And I'll talk about that in a little bit uh, on the next slide. I mean, actually, 140 kilos of nitrogen, we both thought was probably on the edges uh, and, and probably weren't looking at six grain nitrogen. 140, uh, 45 acre, 140 plus for sugars, 1.55, and 190 um, with, 100, with 190 kilograms of nitrogen treatments, uh, lower nitrogen uptake there as well in the grain. And actually, when we look at the yield responses, uh, on, the, on the end calculator, we achieved 9.46 tonne, the sugars 9.32, uh, and on the farm standard 9.1. Was it an increase in shading? Did we increase too much biomass in the crop? I don't know. The organic fragment in the soil uh, tends to have a very 
um, positive effect on cycling nitrogen. So if you're doing a soil nitrogen test and you've got a large mineralizable bank and you use a have had a history of using sewage sludge, more than likely you're going to get a lot of that available to the crop. Uh, regardless of whether you applied the sewage sludge two, three, four years ago, um, that microbial biomass um, uh, and use efficiency, nitrogen use efficiency, plant health, so understanding how much potassium you've got is hugely important. And an easy one is sulphur. You know, always apply sulphur. And if you've listen to what um, Sky was saying about legumes and you're interested in that sort of thing, whatever you do, apply sulphur. And you can apply sulphur in various different forms, straight in the form of keyserite, polysulfate, potash plus. Yourselves, if you've got fertilizer in the shed or you've got fertilizer to buy, this is a really good calculation to maybe help you understand things. So what is it? It's basically the relationship between the value of your nitrogen to the value of your grain and typically the fertilizer manual is based upon a five to one ratio so anything uh, below that you may maybe got an economic justification to put more nitrogen on or anything above that you've got an economic justification to say well actually we should be reducing our nitrogen it increases you slip along a response curve downwards now if, if you're going to play about the nitrogen rates in terms of reducing rates I think the safe zone between 200 and 140, 150 kilograms of nitrogen, I'm quite happy. <clears throat> if you're going to grow milling wheats um, and you're going to be heading into the, the, the region sub 150, I think you're really going to struggle unless you've got a huge population of nitrogen in the soil. Um, and with a good pal of mine, Tim Inchley, farms in Nottinghamshire, whereabouts? Uh, in between Nottingham and Newark, near Southern. So south. on the old boys' land. <laughs> Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, really. boys, then. So, just what do you find interesting this morning, Tim? Uh, definitely about nitrogen levels, how much nitrogen we're using, how much maybe we could cut back yeah. because of the price of nitrogen. All important. Yeah, and what about sewage sludge? Are you using any of that? Yeah, we've started last year for the first year. Yeah. So, it'll be interesting to see where we get away with it, especially the sulfur levels as well. Right, we've got the uh, second part about the start with me waffling, so I better stop waffling now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> pictures of GAIs, we saw some pictures of rape, we talked about nitrogen and where to, to, uh, to save on it. I'll make a very bold statement, but it is. A lot of all seed rape crops are overfed, overfed. There's too much nitrogen applied to a lot of rape crops. So this one is actually uh, taken from one of Andrew's fields a couple of years ago. Uh, vetch for seed, clover for seniors there on the heathland. Again, it's that lighter soil type. And actually, that went into a spring oak crop. Full soil and audit is going to be conducted uh, in the spring to actually try to see. So I, I'm screaming. I, I know that the 22 acre is different to squires now in terms of a little bit different soil structure wise. I've got more worms. I've got more root activity, surely it must be moving in the right direction and that's the frustration <coughs> strategy with various components of this to try and make that assessment of our soil, its relationship with carbon, clay contents etc and more worm counts <coughs> um, or worm activity is certainly um, monitored. Um, infiltration rates a really good indicator as well of those compacted areas go back to my headland turning headlands poorly performing fields is it uh, that then brings all this together so we've got some uh, pretty straightforward measurements that actually allow us to make some management decisions and the reporting of those, this is just an example, the vest test itself. We've got a good soil, soil to improve or low <coughs> resilience soil. All of these points go hand in hand with the, the other tests themselves. We raise this sort of stuff on heavy land, I don't want stubble turnips in it. Because the sheep go back and start eating them again and actually that causes uh, more damage. They've got to be grazed quickly. Um, and I certainly know some farms that did some of this last year even on heavy soils, found it actually dried reasonably well. So we'll have a look at that. In previous years, uh, and obviously it allows us to do days like this, and we can obviously do our R&D and bring you guys what we think is the you know, top 
up-to-date knowledge uh, so we can bring your farms forward over the next years. So, without you, enjoy a bit of lunch and thank you for coming. We're just getting this soil and beet tops cleaned up now from the, the other day you saw in the video from last week when we're loading the beet lorries. Just shows how it heats up already with the tops in it. And uh, we're gonna go and tip this on the field, level it out, and then we shall work it in before we drill the field so it'll all get put back in the same field it came from. Remember I said that's the disease. We always try and put the soil back in the same field it's come off because there's quite a lot of um, soil borne diseases or you can get them with sugar beet. Just having a quick look at the winter wheat that was uh, from the first field of sugar beet we lifted. Still see it's a little bit cloddy here in the gateway, but generally across the field looking really good. This was harvested, sugar beet was harvested here on uh, September the 25th, so quite early. But yeah, managed to get a good uh, wheat established in here, so this will be good. So we're just tipping it up. So we can just see it coming out the back now. Spread it a little bit and then we'll spread it with the fork lift when it comes out. You see it coming out the back there, but there'll be a big heap of it in a minute. There we go. Manitou now and spread that out really thinly. You can just see how it's all heated up and steaming in the field as well. So we've tipped that out and Ruben's now spreading it out. So that was one trailer load. So we've spread it out really thin like that and then we'll work it all in and you won't see it all, it'll all disappear when we drill the crop. Pile there. Just level it out. We would normally solo this land now after the sugar beet harvest harvester. It's uh, quite dry on top at the minute now. It's a good, good bright day today and dry atmosphere. But unfortunately, we've got a bit of a problem with the solo in that we can't get the hydraulic legs down and there's a problem with one of the valve blocks or something so at the minute we're having to go along with the solo without the legs in the ground so it's just the disc which is expensive operation but there's nothing we can do about it at least we'll get the field worked and drilled in the next couple of days so it's just a bit of an issue that we need to sort out but it's going to take us a bit longer to do than the time we've got now i think so i'll just show you what that problem is legs aren't in the ground they should all be down and there'll be a hydraulic valve there'll be a blockage somewhere so we're just going through here to mix the tops up mix the soil up and then we'll have to just uh, we'll go through with the elita and maybe the unipress on the back of that we need the elita underneath just to alleviate any compaction issues underneath from the beet harvester but we'll go through with that and uh, then hopefully get it to get it drilled this is the headland from the disking and we hope to drill this or plant wheat in here tomorrow We've got a little bit of work to do to get this ready yet but we want to try and get it done before the weekend and uh, just in case the weather breaks because it is really good conditions at the moment um, Frankie loves munching on sugar beet. <laughs> it's great that is, she always finds them somewhere. So this machine, the Alita, is the same machine we put the cover crops in with in September, which you've seen on some of my previous videos, and the same machine that we put all seed rape in when we go back to growing it. We're currently on a three year holiday from that at the moment. But quite cloddy conditions here. 
see the legs there, loosening it underneath. The rollers and we've got the... Frankie! Got the uni press on the back. So the time's down, just getting a bit more tilt. So there we have a quick clip of before we've gone over with this machine and there it is after. So you can see there, more or less in the line where Frank is, there's a big difference there. So pleased with that, that's, that's good for middle of November on this soil type. Quick update on one or two fields of wheat and what they're looking like and establishing like. But first of all, I just can't believe how dry it is for November. You can see I'm on my boots, not Wellingtons, and there's just nothing stuck to them at all. And I think that's maybe some of the problem with this area. It's still a little bit thin compared to when you look up the field. When you look up uh, up there, that's a bit better, but it's still a bit thin down here, but it really is dry. And it's long-term grass, if you remember, come out of long-term grass, this, this particular field, 18 years grass, but it is still very dry underneath. There is still some, still trying to make its way through the ground and it was drilled, I think from memory, about October the 12th, 14th, somewhere there. So been in a while now, but it's not as bad as it was going to be. And it has thickened out a bit, but uh, long-term grass, 18 years grass, and it still is a little bit of a, a problem trying to establish wheat after this, but, um, it's not slugs and it's not wireworm, it's just had treatment. But anyway, it's not looking too bad. It has thickened out a bit. The grass field we've just looked at is just to the side of the hedge there. And that variety, by the way, was Shabras, a feed variety. And when you look at the field next door here, really pleased with this foul, sticky clay soil. And this looks the best we've had it for a number of years. This is, I think, the fourth year or fifth year it's been wheat on the trot and uh, with the prices and the way it is starting to do more of this um, and when you get establishment like this yeah i'm quite um, quite happy to do that we've got on top of black grass that's normally the reason why we haven't drilled uh, early we'd normally drill about the 25th of october but this was drilled middle of october so we're starting to bring drilling forward now because uh, we've got on top of black grass and that grass weed that those of you not sure what that is real problematic grass weed that really knocks yield badly when you're looking across into the sunlight here, really good. We did put a little bit more seed on this because of the establishment of it and the soil type. Planted in the middle of October, and I think from memory, it was 430 seeds a square meter, somewhere there, and uh, really good um, establishment. So pleased with this, best it's looked for a while. I'm stood in the field that you've just seen the sugar beet harvested from that area. You've just seen it at the start of this week's video and this bit here was lifted about uh, three weeks ago and we managed to get it worked and planted with wheat straight away and it's just coming through the ground you can just see and looking okay but it just shows this soil type how cloddy it is and there's a bit of clay content to this soil so it's very difficult soil and you just can't afford to get leave it in the ground too long so that's why we harvest this sugar beet uh, quite early so you can just see there the clods and what the soil's like. There is still quite a bit just coming through. Highest seed rate we put on, 450 seeds a square meter, I think it was. Hello, Frankie. Um, and uh, still a bit more to come through, but, but looking all right. And there is the sugar beet pile on the concrete there. That's gonna be going into the factory uh, end of next week, which you'll see that. So we'll just have a look at this uh, soil here. So that's the edge of the drilling that we did last time still some coming through and this is what we've just worked from what you've just seen a second ago in the last video and it is drying now we are leaving it to dry until monday you can just see there it's dry nicely actually these clods just beginning to break up a bit and it's yeah but it's still a bit plasticine underneath but it'll be fine leave it a couple of days there's no rain forecast and we'll plant it on monday but still a little bit rough but our simba drill will do a lot at this because of the tires in it and the way the drill operates and the way it puts the seed in the ground but you'll see this working in next week's video so in this same sugar beet field we've got a herbicide trial and it's really you never know what they're like unless you leave a bit so we've got a full spray breed there you can see another peg there and another peg somewhere on that corner so the area between these four pegs hasn't been done with the pre-emergence herbicide we're just going to calibrate the machine calibrate the drill to get the right seed rate on but the thousand grain rate of here 
is 57.7 grams, which seems a lot for new seed. So Tom's just gonna check that to see whether it's right or not. So now we're just counting out a thousand seeds to make sure the weight on the bag is right because it will seriously affect the kilograms per hectare and the amount of seed we use. So I'll leave Tom and Ruben quiet while they count. We've had a great night tonight. Happy birthday to James today. Happy birthday to Joe yesterday. Hope you enjoyed this week's waffle. Back on next week. Any questions, please let me know. Thanks for the subscribers and we'll see you next week. Cheers. Cheers, we'll let Cheers you know. guys. Cheers. 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 This is to Andrew proposing to, to Rhonda. <laughs> <laughs>